Good morning, everyone. In case you didn't catch it from before, my name is Shane Peters, and I am one of the interns here at Grace Warman. Now, today I have good news, I have bad news, and then I have really good news. Uh, the good news is that I am not scheduled to do this again until August. The bad news is you will need all seven months to recover because this is a long sermon. I'm not kidding. It is terribly long. I worked at cutting it, and I failed. Now, the really good news is the sermon is God's Word, which we're going to continue through here. Now, over the last number of months, we've been going through the book of Luke. Today, we'll continue through chapter 9. I'll invite you to open your Bible or Bible app to Luke 9, starting in verse 18. If you don't have a Bible, go get one. There's Bibles on the table as you entered, and they are free for anyone to use. And frankly, you can keep it as a gift if you don't have one already. Now, we're going to read out the passage behind me, and after that's been read out, we'll pray together. Reading from Luke, chapter 9, verses 18 to 27. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah, and others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. All right, let's pray. Uh, Father, I do ask that you would um, quicken this passage to our hearts, that it would sink deep, that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, that you would raise us to life, and that the Father would reveal Jesus to us even today. In your name, amen. I'm going to give a, a brief overview of where we've been the last few weeks. Hopefully this will help those of you that have forgotten and for those of you that are here for the first time. Two weeks ago, Clay took us through the first nine verses of chapter 9. He recounted how Jesus called together his 12 apostles and sent them out on a specific mission with specific instructions. They were to proclaim the kingdom of God, heal, take nothing for the journey, remain in the first house that welcomed them, and they were to shake the dust off of their feet as they left any town that didn't accept them. I have to say that I found that part of the sermon to be of particular interest, and if you haven't already heard it, I highly recommend finding that sermon on gracesask.com. Now, because of the disciples going out, many people heard about the kingdom of God, many were healed, and many heard about Jesus. Even Herod, the ruler of the area, heard what was going on. We read in that passage that Herod was perplexed because the crowds were saying that Jesus was John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the prophets. And you no doubt notice this list matches what we have in our passage today. And on that Sunday, Two weeks ago, which we called Partnership Sunday, Clay and Mark talked about what it means to partner with this church, Grace Fellowship, on a specific mission, with specific instructions, namely, to love Jesus, to love people, and to help people love Jesus. Now, I expect last week's sermon is clear to you in your mind, so I'll just say that Mark went through the section of Luke immediately preceding today. And it told of how Jesus fed thousands through a miraculous multiplication 
of some fish and bread that was on hand. And Mark showed that when we follow Jesus, the impossible can become possible even if we don't understand what God is doing or how it will come to pass. And now we come to today's passage. As a bit of a framework for working through today's passage, I'm going to ask you to consider who Jesus is with at any given time. What we'll find in this passage, that this passage can be broken down into three parts. In the first part, we'll find only one character, namely Jesus alone. We find that part in the first half of verse 18, and this will be our shortest part. In the second part, we'll see more characters, namely Jesus with his disciples. That'll be in the second part of verse 18 to verse 22. And in the third and final part, we gain even more characters, namely Jesus, his disciples, and a crowd. This last section will take into account verses 23 to 27. So let's move to part one. As I mentioned, the shortest, shortest section today is part one, and it concerns Jesus being alone. It's a somewhat perplexing passage because it seems to indicate two contradictory statements. It says, now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. That's troubling. Either Jesus is alone or he was with his disciples. So which was it? How can both be true? Well, picture this. You are in a crowd that has spied Jesus and his disciples in the distance. Your crowd begins to move towards them, but you're still a long ways away. Now, change perspective. You're one of the disciples. You notice this crowd in the distance, and you can see, oh, they've noticed us. They're starting to come close. So I see the disciples here interrupting Jesus to ask him how they were going to handle the crowds this time. So this is how I see Jesus being alone, and yet at the same time with his disciples. So what do we have in the first part other than Jesus alone? Well, really all we have is Jesus praying. That seems like an awfully small detail, and you may wonder, why do I mention it? I mention it because of the eight or so instances that Luke records Jesus praying, about six of those times, something spectacular happens. Jesus prayed after his baptism and just before the heavens opened up and the Father declared him to be the beloved Son in chapter 3. He prayed before he chose his apostles in chapter 6, before he was transfigured later in chapter 9, and just before he was betrayed and sent to his death in chapter 22. We don't know what Jesus was praying, but we will take an educated guess later on in this sermon. So part ends when... Part one ends with the disciples near and Jesus finishing his prayer. And what should we expect? Well, Jesus is praying. So expect something amazing. We move to part two, and it starts with the second half of verse 18. And he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Why did Jesus ask this question? Already in our series, in Luke 5, for example, we discovered that Jesus perceived the thoughts of some Pharisees. And later in Luke 9, it says that Jesus knew the reasoning of the disciples' hearts. If Jesus knows the hearts and thoughts of people, why would he ask this question? It's obvious that he's not asking in order to gain new information. He already knew. He always knew. So if Jesus asked this question... They already know the answer to, well, we need to ask. Why ask this question? Think about it. Why do you ask questions when you already know the answer? Well, you might ask this as a way to test someone's knowledge or honesty or intelligence. You may know that your child broke the window, but you still ask if he broke it. It's a test. Or you may ask this type of question as the lead-in to more questions with the ultimate goal of taking someone on a journey of discovery. In our passage today, I think we have both situations. Jesus' question is partially a test, but it's primarily about leading the disciples to something new. 
To start the journey, Jesus first wants the disciples to think about what others say about him. Jesus is setting up a comparison and contrast scenario, giving them the opportunity to think about the options floating out there among the crowds. And the disciples give those options in verse 19. And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah. And others, others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Again, this is the same list that we saw from Herod in Luke 9, 7 to 9, two weeks ago. And this confirms that amongst the crowds at this time, there were three predominant identity theories. For many, in Jesus, they recognized John the Baptist. John lived and breathed among these people. So it's likely that many had seen or heard him. There would have been others that never saw or heard John. Instead, these people recognized Jesus as Elijah, the Old Testament prophet. I think we should give the crowd some credit because these two guesses actually make a lot of sense. Jesus was doing a very, very many Elijah-like things. Elijah had raised people from the dead, healed and fed people in miraculous ways, just like Jesus. And the identity of Jesus was also confusing to the people as John the Baptist had already been recognized as Elijah to come again. In fact, Jesus had said that John was Elijah come again. Now, for those that could not square this identity problem of John or Elijah, they elected for a third way. They didn't know who Jesus was, but he reminded them of what they knew of the prophets from old, such as Jeremiah. So maybe he was one of them, come back to life. So, it seems, at bare minimum, the crowd sensed that there was some kind of relationship between Jesus and God. And somehow that relationship was similar to how God operated through the prophets. Jesus followed up his question and personalizes it for the disciples in verse 20. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Don't get hung up on the but in the question because that simply indicates that Jesus' plan all along was to get to this next question by asking the first. Now, this question Jesus asks is a very personal question. This question is pushy. It's a question forcing an answer. And it also begs the question that we all need to consider. Who do you say that Jesus is? Not only who do you say that Jesus is, but how does your life reveal who you believe? Jesus is? Do we live as though Jesus is our true Lord, our Messiah, our rescuer? Do we live as if he is the one who demands our loyalty and attention? Or do we live with Jesus as an afterthought? Is he first in our mind or is he usually pushed out of our minds? Is he Lord? Or is he just someone that you expect to make your life a little more comfortable? a little more enjoyable, a little more bearable. These are hard, pushy, uncomfortable questions, and I don't apologize for them. But also, I won't belabor them. So let's come back to the text. Jesus asked the disciples to tell him who they think he is. In light of what the crowds believe, in light of what they have heard him say, in light of what they have seen him do, after doing an in-depth analysis of available evidence, who is Jesus? And verse 20 continues, And Peter answered, The Christ of God. Now, Christ is the Greek term for anointed or Messiah. You may have heard this term often, and perhaps its significance has been lost to you. But this title of Jesus is eminently important. Let's think about what has happened in the first eight chapters of Luke. Thus far, there are only two entities that have correctly identified Jesus on earth. And neither is human. One is the angels, and the other are the demons. The angels announced Jesus' coming, and the demons freaked out every time Jesus came near. They were terrified of him, and correctly identified him over and over and over again. 
Jesus was always telling them to shut up. And they always begged him not to torture them before the appointed time. In this passage, Peter correctly identifies who Jesus is. And according to Luke's account, he's the first human ever to do so. This is so remarkable that I can't really begin to give you a sense of the gravity of this revelation. Now, I have a theological point I need to make here. And while I have avoided using parallel accounts from Matthew and Mark until now, there is one verse I need to use from Matthew 16, 17. In that verse, it's revealed that Jesus' identity was not discovered by Peter. Peter didn't come to this conclusion on his own. It says flesh and blood, meaning people, meaning natural reasoning, meaning personal wisdom, did not reveal this to Peter. It says that the Father in heaven was the one who revealed this. This is a fundamentally important concept to grasp. Did you know we can't know Jesus truly unless the Father first reveals us to him, reveals him to us? So the question Jesus asks is for each of us. Each of us are asked, who do you say that I am? But it's actually God that gives us the ability to answer that question. A couple of implications for us. If God has mercifully brought you here today, perhaps for the first time, you've been blessed with the opportunity to consider this question. And if you don't know Jesus yet, if you don't know what you would even say if someone came up to you and asked, who do you say Jesus is? Then our passage today shows you what your first step is. What is that first step? To pray. But for what? The same thing Jesus was praying for before the disciples interrupted him. What was Jesus praying before the disciples interrupted? Well, I really believe that Jesus was praying that the Father would show the disciples who Jesus was. And I think Peter's confession showed that the Father answered Jesus' prayer. So you can have great hope that if you pray, the Father will reveal Jesus to you. He will. Discerning the identity of Jesus is a spiritual activity. That's why angels and demons knew who he was, and that's how Peter now has the spiritual sight to see Jesus as he really is, the Christ of God. Without the sight the Father gives, we too will be blind to Jesus. We continue part two with an unusual directive in verse 21. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell no one. We might expect Jesus wants everyone to know exactly who he is. But right now, that's not the case. And why are they to keep it to themselves? Well, Jesus responds this way because there's a problem involving expectation versus reality that he needs to deal with. Now, I'm going to try to explain this problem and the reason Jesus' command in a way that I hope will make sense for us today. I want you to think of job descriptions. Our modern job description tells us what we are supposed to be doing. It outlines expectations, goals, acceptable performance, and so on. The problem for Jesus at this time in his ministry was that the Jews had a job description for the Christ that differed completely from what Jesus intended to do. The Jews knew how they had sinned and been sent into exile in the past. And they never wanted to experience that again. So they read their scriptures, their history, and they attempted to change how they worshipped and how they lived to keep that part of their history from ever repeating. As they read, they also saw, saw another part of their history. They saw that in the past, their armies and kings had dominated the region. And they saw in many passages a promise that someday they would reign again. In their scriptures, they saw a king would set up an everlasting kingdom. It would be led by a hero, a warrior, one that would set them free from every oppressive power. It would be like David's kingdom, only better. While they were no longer in exile and 
while they were living in their own land, they weren't alone. People from the nations surrounding them lived among them. And they had not self-ruled for hundreds of years. They longed to be free from the grip of their Roman masters. They longed to be pure. And they longed to be in power. Jesus doesn't want anyone to know who he is. Because the people would seek to make him their political and military leader. So it's this problem of Christ's misunderstood job description that Jesus needs to deal with. Jesus' actual job was to fulfill scriptures such as Isaiah 53 that pointed to a suffering servant. The Jews could never square how that suffering figure fit into God's plan to restore them to glory. So Jesus doesn't want the Jews to be told who he is, and then he explains why. He basically gives God's description for the Christ, and it's completely opposite of what everyone was expecting. His explanation basically reads as the worst job description ever. It says in verse 22 that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. Who would want this job? Suffering and rejection and death? Would you want that job? Would you apply on Indeed for that job? Who then? Well, Jesus wanted it. He stepped up. And notice the word must coming out of his mouth. Jesus' destiny was to suffer. It was something he must do. And he did it willingly. Jesus did not object to being rejected. He had to be rejected. It must happen, because that's why he's here. Jesus was surely going to be killed. There was never any doubt. And the good news after that, he was surely going to be raised on the third day, because he must. I have struggled to think of what the disciples would have thought of this job description. I think the full meaning was hidden from them. The parallel in Matthew gives some indication that Peter basically understood it, but Peter didn't like what he heard. I'm sure some of them were shocked. And for us today, looking back, we should be as shocked as they were. I think what shocks us most today is that not everyone loved Jesus. Not everyone liked what he had to say. Think about the groups that would reject Jesus. Who does the passage say would reject and kill him? The elders, the priests describes the entire political and religious leadership of Israel, the best people, the most devoted to God and the scriptures, and the ones most desiring and expecting a Messiah. These, these were the ones that would reject Jesus. It is a remarkable thing that Jesus would humble himself and allow himself to be rejected. Jesus the eternal, eternal word, creator of the universe, God incarnate, fully God, fully man, coming to his own, that which he made, only to be rejected. There are not enough words in the world that can drive this deep enough into our hearts. Jesus came to be rejected and to die for you and for me. Our second part is finally finished. Let's look at the remaining verses that form part three. Verse 23 says, And he said to all, Picture the crowd has arrived. Jesus addresses them all, disciples and the crowd alike. And keep in mind what this mixed crowd thinks about Jesus. Most suspect he's John the Baptist or Elijah, or maybe a prophet. Only his disciples know him as Christ. The verse continues, If anyone would come after me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How do we come after Jesus? The text says by denying oneself. But what does that mean? 
I've struggled with for months on this one as well. The concept of denying self is far deeper than we could ever imagine. It is hard to consider denying myself when myself is almost all I ever think of. I think one facet about denying oneself, at least in, as it's presented here, is related to the concept of repentance. So how do we come after Jesus? By going in the direction he's going. And that means changing directions. It means moving from our current direction and going in the exact opposite direction. How? By denying or repenting of our selfish purposes, our evil plans, and our fleshly desire. We do this by putting off what we want. Now, again, I need to make something clear before I go on. What I just said may sound like it all depends on you. It does not. Was it not the Father that revealed to the disciples who Jesus was? Scripture demonstrates a both and dynamic that is hard for us to understand. There are high demands on us, and we will be held personally responsible. And yet it is God who gives us faith and repentance and the desire to follow him. Jesus is the start and end and continuing force in our Christian life through the power of the Spirit. So while I want to be clear with this, I don't want to soften too much our own responsibility before God. So what direction is Jesus going? The direction of suffering, rejection, and death. He says we are to take up our cross. Just as we put off and deny ourselves and repent, we are to put on the life of Christ. We are to go the same direction as Jesus and embrace a life of suffering, rejection, and pain. Now, if you have a way to highlight your Bible, you probably want to highlight the word daily in this section. Each and every day, we must wake up and decide, will we join the way that Jesus is already walking, or will we walk our own way? Are we going to live with gospel intentionality, or will we live for our own desires? Each day, daily, we must choose. I really wonder if this is why Jesus modeled prayer for us in the way he did. The Gospels recount often him rising and going to a solitary place to pray. And I wonder, how do we get going in Jesus' direction each day if we don't start each morning in prayer and scripture. I wonder. Now, I want to talk for a moment about our start in Christ and then our ongoing relationship thereafter. The start of our life in Christ involves putting off self, denying ourselves and repenting, and it involves the opposite action, putting on Christ, his cross, his purposes, his will. That is the start. The ongoing life in Christ is about a slow, ongoing process. We call it sanctification. And what it means is that we are changed day by day by the Holy Spirit to become more like Jesus. And often it seems so slow that we wonder if it's happening at all. While we are made new creations, when we first repent and follow Jesus. And while the Spirit inhabits us and gives us power that we have never known and new desires, the fleshly part of us still wars. We still desire what we don't want to desire, and we still don't do what we should do. However, the more and more we mature in Christ, the more we put off our old self and put on Christ, the more we look like him. So that is the daily part. It's a slow process. But where's the good news? It only lasts as long as we're alive. If we are in Christ, when we die, the process is completed. And that is of infinite more worth than gaining the whole world. I wonder if that's going to come up. 
So why must we choose each day, verse 24 says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? We choose each day because those that endure to the end have life. Their life will be saved. But if we try to save our life, maintain it, clutch it, and hold on to it, and live our own way, we will ultimately lose our life. Jesus asked us to join in his life because in his life there is final everlasting life, even when it seems like we're dying. Jesus said he must die, but he also said he must be raised again and live. If he says we must live with him, if we die on account of him, who are we to argue? Why would we argue against such a great benefit to us? Would we rather have the world? No, because if we gain the whole world but don't have Christ, we forfeit our very selves. Nothing is worth losing your very self. And remember what you gain. Jesus isn't just about losing. He's more concerned with your greatest gain. He wants you to truly desire ultimate life in him, in a life that's abundant and free with complete joy. He wants you to be saved. We finally move to the second last verse of our text today. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This will be hard, but think of a time when you've been ashamed. Maybe think of when you got in trouble at school and felt shame. Didn't you feel worse and worse the more people found out? And wasn't it the worst when people you respect found out? Or when mom and dad found out? Now, imagine today was the last day on earth. Sometime today, Jesus is coming back in his glory. And the Father is there in his glory. And the angels are there in their glory. And you are brought before all of them. They know all you have thought and said and done. They know your every intention, desire, and plan. And there you stand. Where do you stand? If you don't know who Jesus is, then you stand ashamed and condemned. Jesus in this verse is warning of something more awful than any horror movie we could ever imagine. Condemned. And we, ashamed, we stand before a glorious God. What hope do we have? Well, you're in church and we're talking about Jesus. So we probably have tremendous hope. Tremendous. Think about this first, but in reverse. For whoever is unashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be unashamed when he comes. But we need to go beyond not being ashamed of Jesus and his words. We need to love him and his words. We need him to be our greatest pride and joy. We need to want people to know that we are glad to be in Jesus and that in him and his work is all we have to boast about. Now think about shame for another moment. Who suffered the most shameful treatment on earth? Who bore our shame upon himself? Wasn't it shameful? that sinful men crucified Jesus? He took our shame by being shamed. And do you know what? Jesus says the shame was worth it. Someday Jesus will come in glory, and his suffering will ultimately lead to his kingdom, where he will have the glory he had before the beginning of time. As we leave this verse, let's ask the question, when Jesus comes into his kingdom, Who will be ashamed? Our last verse is verse 27. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. 
This verse sets up next week's passage. I don't want to spoil it too much for you, but next week, Jesus goes up on a mountain with Peter, John, and James, and he is transfigured before them. These three disciples get to go beyond knowing Jesus' identity. They get to see his glory in an unimaginable way, in a way that represents a foretaste of Jesus' kingdom. And this verse is also for us today. Some of you today will not taste death, not real death, because if you know Jesus, you've already been tasting Jesus, tasting true life. His spirit is in you as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. You've already been tasting the kingdom of God, but it is only a taste. What comes later is far better than anything we could imagine. Jesus is the taste of what is to come that makes everything else worth it. If we know Jesus as the Christ, as our Messiah, as our anointed one, if we have repented, denying our own desires and plans, if we count our life as death and his life as true life, and if we take up our cross daily, then it is not all suffering. All suffering. If you are in Jesus, then your shame has been removed. So remember, he took it, so you don't need to keep holding on to it. His death was your death, and now his life is your life. Your shame, from the standpoint of how God sees you, is gone, and your life is made complete and full. This concludes our three parts. What should we consider as our time nears an end? You don't know today if today is your last day on earth. You don't. You, tro you truly don't. I may not see you next week. Can you answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? If you can't, then ask the Father. He wants and desires and glories in revealing his son Jesus. And if you want help discovering what the Father is saying to you, come ask an elder. That's the reason and purpose for them being elders in the church. It would be their joy to talk with you. Jesus denied himself and took up his cross. He suffered and was rejected. He did everything for us that we could not do. The work is finished. But how do we respond to this finished work? With gratitude. He invites us to follow him now, to follow his way of the cross, as a response to his finished work. We're not denying ourselves or picking up our crosses in order to save ourselves. We follow Jesus because he's worthy. He's already saved us. He is good. And it is the right response to such a great salvation that he has bought for us through his suffering, through his rejection, through his death, and ultimately through his resurrection. If you would see your life saved, fully saved. Follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, may we consider that question deeply, who you are. Cleanse of our minds the, the thoughts that we have that don't reflect who you really are, our preconceptions, our hurts that have clouded the truth, the lies we've been told that you aren't who you say you are, the lies that make us think that what comes next can't be any better than how I'm living now. I'm enjoying my life. How could it get any better? Or maybe we have a terrible life. We hate our life, and we just are so depressed we can't imagine it could be as good as the Bible says it is. Father, press into us that you have abundant life, as a foretaste here now through your spirit, but with ultimate lasting life thereafter. Pray for everyone here that they would consider who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.